Okay. The quiz for this afternoon are done by Professor Cid uh, Araújo. He's the, he'll be the next speaker. So uh, if you guys don't know the answer, he will talk to you a little bit later. But the first one is to understand what is the uh, nonlinear susceptibility is for the second or morning and self-focusing. Remember that um, uh, Professor Roy Taylor talked uh, actually about self-focusing, and what would, what should be the description or actually the, the equation for the uh, effective chi two or in this case chi three for self-focusing, and also. Uh, another for self-defocusing, also Roy mentioned a little bit, and I think uh, uh, Sid will talk a little bit more, uh, but looking over the spatial profile for this. And last one is, oh, there's <coughs> the equation is not there. So I will put the, the, the answers for all of them. The, the first two, but you have to find out how you you get to that, okay? And the last one is you have also to show the effective susceptibility, okay? Um, again, for the first one that do this, you'll get a prize. Of course, is our, our T-shirts. We have a bag of T-shirts. I'll, I'll bring something different this time, okay? I'll, I'll bring a, a backpack. There's a, a, a small backpack. And um, uh, Sid, Sid will be around also to answer some questions about the quiz, okay? And once more, let me announce the people that should talk to Simone. Abu Enamesh. I almost got it correct. Oh my God, I, I already told you were not in the morning. I already asked you your name. Oh, okay. So how, is, how do you say? Abuaname. Abuaname? Abuaname. And your last name? Ayajin. Okay. So you have to talk to money. Huh? Yeah, for the passport. Okay. Danny Manuel. was also Ernesto Camacho. Michele Moreno, Erika Ludena, Aurani Kunaria, Inga Schneider, a Red Winter. No answer yet? Professor Sid is willing to give you presents, and you guys are not helping him. In the meantime, uh, I will uh, give you guys uh, your insurance for those that sign up for the insurance. So I'll call some names, and I'll give you the insurance. Uh, uh, so Alba Jumbo. Arslan, Andre Aguirre, Andre Aguirre, no? Okay, Professor Sid will explain, and then he'll go on from uh, all, the, all his lectures. I'll try to, to explain what I expect from those questions. Uh, the first one, uh, Let's consider this first case here. So the polarization will be a second order polarization. Like that. What are the exponential part of the imaginary, uh, the imaginary part of the field there should be E raised to I omega t. So 
if we have if we want to create a polarization there so we have a oscillation with a 2 omega okay uh, so we have to put here the amplitude of the field twice times 2 i omega t however the polarization the susceptibility which was calculated by paul in the first class was uh, related to to one anharmonic oscillator which was in vacuum however if the oscillator is inside a video there is the dielectric function around the oscillator so the field which the oscillator will feel is this one multiplied by this factor l so in this case i have the local field and that's the local field which generate the polarization. So we have to multiply this by L squared. Okay? However, this polarization will create a beam, an electric field, which oscillates, which oscillates at 2 omega. Since this polarization is inside the medium, this field should be multiplied by L. So the effective uh, susceptibility should be chi 2 times L squared times L. OK? So it comes to L cubed. Uh, in this case, it goes like that. In this case, we have these modules. Why? Because we have a susceptibility which is generating uh, of nonlinearity in the same frequency. So this susceptibility here should be written like that. Chi 3 of omega, omega, minus omega, omega. So I have to multiply not by the square or by the cube of the electric field. I have to multiply by field E star and E. Okay? This one comes with L times E. This one with L times E star. And this one with L times E. So I have a square modules of L times L. It generates a polarization like in this case. So I have to multiply again by another L. So the result is this here with the modules. OK? So I put this uh, question just to emphasize that the susceptibility depends on the frequencies of the fields that we are combining. OK? If I, I look, for example, for the third harmonic generation, I should put omega plus omega plus omega. But in this case, I'm generating a, a response at the frequency omega. So I have to put this star in here. OK? Second question. I have two, two beams which overlap. This is the strong, and this is the weak beam. And N2 is negative. It means that this region, in this region here, the total refractive index, N0, plus or minus modulus of N2 times I, is smaller than here. So it means that the light which see this part here with le less uh, smaller refractive index will, will be moved to the right. But this part here feels uh, the same N0 as before. So the beam will become narrow, come to here. The answer is the light prefers to go in a region where the refractive index is larger. So the part of the beam which is in the region where the refractive index is small, smaller, will tend to, to go to the other region. Okay? 
So it corresponds to focus it, to make to focus the beam, this beam. So it's a focus induced by this overlap here. If I put another beam like that, which is not in here, but suppose that, that I put another beam like that, then I will make the beam more narrow. And it goes, if the two beams here have the same amplitude, so the beam will propagate uh, narrow and uh, along this direction without overlapping with the strong beam anymore. Try to go uh, far from the strong beam. And the third question, that's what's called cascaded nonlinearity. I did not uh, talk about that, but I wrote this question when Lazar was speaking here. He said, well, if you want to, to have a nonlinearity in the frequency of your laser, you have to go to chi 3. That's what he said. Because if you are with chi 2, you have a, a response in 2 omega. But that's not true. What I'm showing here, what I'm uh, proposing here, he forgot this case. He already worked on this subject before. Suppose that I have a very efficient second harmonic generator. So I have a chi 2, a strong chi 2. So uh, we may have this process here. And then we generate 2 omega. But if 2 omega is too strong, too strong, so this omega can go like that, this 2 omega, and then can generate two other beams. Okay? So what I'm doing here, I am mixing four times the incident field. This one was uh, annihilated. This one was created. So they have opposite signs. OK? That's one possibility. Another possibility is this one here. Suppose that I have omega in here. Then I generate uh, something else, omega 1. And then I generate something here, omega 2. But suppose that omega 2 is too strong. So I can have this process in here, omega 2, omega 1. And then I generate omega. So I have the, this four beams creating frequency at omega. And what I have here is chi 2, chi 2. The amplitude of this beam will be dependent of chi 2. So when it enters here, this beam has an amplitude multiplied by chi 2. I'm going uh, slow. Uh, the field at omega 1, it is uh, calculated saying that we have chi 2 times uh, times the inst I'm sorry yeah times the inst field square okay now you take this field here and the one the other one e of uh, omega 2 is chi 2 times like that but this susceptibility is different from this one this one is uh, This susceptibility is something like omega, omega 1, omega, and omega. That's this, that susceptibility. This one here, I'll call chi 1. This other one is chi 2, omega 2, omega, omega. I'll call chi 2. So we create this field here, which mix again with uh, the other field. So I have to write here that the field which is generated here is equal to uh, E of omega 1, E of omega 2, 
times susceptibility. Which susceptibility? The susceptibility that is associated to this, that creates omega. So this one here is chi 2 of omega, omega 1, omega 2. OK? So when I put here now chi 2, chi 2 here, and chi 2 here, so I have three, three times chi 2. But I'm sorry, this is the polarization. Okay. And this field here has omega 1 and omega 2. Uh, this field goes, yeah, so you see, we have omega, so I will expand this, OK? So I have a P of omega equal to chi 2 times E of omega 1 <laughs> this is this part here, okay? Uh, this one here is a mix, a mixing between this, 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 and this. Oof. So I have four fields. Something is wrong here. Okay. It, uh, it's missing one one guy. And again, here I have this minus omega one and minus omega two because I have the opposite. Okay. And this is minus omega. So I have to put. Yeah, omega. Uh, I have to write everything again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I have here in the first case I have a p of omega one equal to chi two of uh, omega minus plus omega 1 plus omega 2, Ome minus, OK? Minus. And uh, the, the incident field, E of omega, OK? So this polarization creates a field which is frequency omega 1. And uh, so I have this field created there. P of omega 2 is something like chi 2 of omega, uh, of omega minus omega 1. You say minus omega 1 plus omega 2, minus omega 2. No. Yes. The, no, this one should be uh, omega 2 in here. Here is omega 1. Here is omega. And here is minus omega 2. OK? Omega 1, so I did omega instant omega minus omega 1 generating omega 2. OK? Uh, so the other one, 
uh, okay, then I create this field at omega 2, which is going to combine with omega 1 again. So I have, a, a, I, I'm going to create this field here at omega. So I have P of omega is a chi 2. I'll put here later the thing. And then I put here E of uh, omega 1 times E of omega 2. And then, what else? <laughs> N not no yeah look this one generate this frequency this field at omega 2 okay this one generates the field at omega 1 so this one goes with a chi 2 proportional to chi 2 this one goes proportional to chi 2 and then when I put here when I substitute here Then I have, uh, my problem is that, yeah. No, I think that you are uh, completely right. I'm wrong here. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start the class, then I correct that, okay? Let's, uh, let's start a class and then later we can, we can, okay? Because now I became nervous because of that, so I cannot, <laughs> I cannot think anymore. Probably copy wrong your notes. What? Probably copy wrong your notes. No, I think that you are correct. So I became very nervous, so I later I'll come to that. So today I'm going to, to, to present another subject, a little bit different from the, the previous one. Yeah. But before starting with the new subject, I have to, to give answer for someone who asked me last time. Uh, someone asked me, what happens with the scattering? Hmm? What happens with the scattering of light? Why I did not consider? Something is wrong with the computer now, it's a uh, block. It. Tiago, I need your help. <laughs> Tiago, I need your help. <laughs> What's this? Oh, What? I thought it was a blue screen on the project. No, no, it's, it's, something is wrong here. No, that, that was the last one of the last class. So, who? Okay. So now, I want, ah, uh, yes. Today I want to, to, to talk about this disordered photonics. Disordered means that uh, we are interested in the disordered structures that scatter light very much. So someone at the end of the past class asked me about the scattering of light in the colloid that I used. And my answer was that, well, there are some scattering. However, this scattering is negligible because the particles have a diameter which is much smaller than the light wavelength. If I increase the size of the particles, then the scattering will be important. And uh, Uh, in both cases, we have this uh, field which people are uh, now uh, using these words to, to characterize. That's disordered photonics. And a few examples of that is that people are looking for Anderson localization of light. That's localization of light in a way equivalent to the localization of the wave function of uh, ele uh, electrons in a solid. Uh, There are some interest in imaging through a scattering media, 
You want to make a picture of something that's happened in a medium which is completely scattering, like uh, in a, uh, how you say neblina in English? Fog, in fog. You may be interested in uh, optical nonlinearities. And uh, one topic that I'm interested in here is uh, random lasers. So what I want to tell you is what a random laser is, how it works, and uh, what are the different kind of random lasers, and what's for we studied random laser. But before that, I want to, to comment about this question that someone there, I think it was you, asked me, is that how to measure the refractivity of a medium which uh, is scattering light very much. So there is this technique which uh, was published uh, several years ago, where they uh, use a kind of a reshaping of the pulse which propagates in the medium. Uh, so this technique is very good, but it's limited to some conditions, like uh, you have to have a large repetition rate for your laser, and the amplitude of the pulse should be modulated. Uh, when we start doing experiments with the scattering media with larger particles, we try to use this technique, but we found that it does not, it's very complicated. So we developed another technique, which is much simpler, and uh, what's called scattered light imaging method. So the colloid that we are uh, studying here is a liquid with the particles silica particles, for example, with diameter of 100 nanometers. So the scatter of light is large. And we use the same uh, setup that I presented you in the previous le lecture, using uh, some optics here and a CCD to collect the side view image of the cell. So what you see here is that what happens if I focus the beam in the center of the cell. So you see like that. And uh, then there are two parameters to consider here. One is the beam waste, and the other one is the angle, the divergence angle of the beam. So if you have these two uh, uh, parameters, then you can describe what's going on with the propagation of this beam in the medium. And uh, what we observe here is that uh, the beam radius, it changes linearly with the distance of propagation there. In this case, there is no nonlinear optics here, just a linear optics, a scatter of light. We use this to measure uh, any two in one condition that Z scan does not work. So now we have this uh, way to do that. In this case here, we have a silica with 100 nanometers diameter, ethanol and acetone, it's a mix mixing of these two liquids. And we focus the beam in the entrance of the cell. And uh, what we did here was we measured this angle, divergence angle, as a function of uh, uh, intensity. And then we did some calculation in order to connect this divergence angle with the parameters of the material. So the parameters are uh, the refract effective refractive index, the intensity of the beam, uh, and the geometrical, the wavelength, and the geometrical parameters that I put in here. So by doing this, we can calculate the refractive index. In this case, this is the result that we expect, because the, the nonlinearity of silica is very small. And this technique would not, do not have sensitivity enough to measure uh, these uh, uh, changes in the refractive index. So only chi 3 is contributing here. So that's, this is one technique which is very uh, spontaneous, the way to measure that. So we don't have to have this shaping of, reshaping of the image. So it's possible in principle, if we increase the concentration of the silica particles, uh, it's possible to get this, this, uh, this value of N2 and in this case, it does not change as a function of intensity. So it's in, by doing this, we can get an uh, answer using this technique by changing the filling fraction, the volume, the relative amount of these liquids, and get the 
nonlinear refractive index. So this is the answer for the question that uh, she raised uh, in the last uh, last class. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it will be very complicated because you have to to couple your light in your film and put your camera uh, somewhere. In principle, yes, but it's difficult. Okay. But uh, from my point of view, this is the simplest way to measure the nonlinear refractive index in a scattering medium, in a highly scattering medium. Okay, so we start the class of today. And uh, that's my plan. I want to, to tell you what random lasers are. Uh, so I have to tell you a short story about that. And then I I'll show you some applications. And uh, so let's start with a little bit of story. And the first, what a, a random laser. It's a very special kind of laser where there is no optical cavity. Uh, the optical feedback is due to light scattering by particles in a medium which uh, there is a gain and there is the particles to scatter light. So these particles act like a lot of mirrors inside the liquid, which I'm interested in. Or in, uh, mirrors inside the gain medium, which could be not only a liquid, but could be also a powder. We can arrange this uh, material to operate as a one-dimensional laser two-dimensional laser or three-dimensional geometry. Yeah. So it can be used as a, in a waveguide, in a membrane, colloids, etc. So let's compare what a, a conventional laser and what is a random laser. So this thing you know very well. That's the conventional laser with narrow line width, long coherence time, large spatial coherence, directionality and speckle. That is a problem with a laser, conventional laser, speckle. If you want to make images with a laser, then it's a problem. A random laser is exactly the opposite of a conventional laser. There is no directionality. The photos go in all directions. Large line width, short coherence time, small spatial coherence, no directionality, but no speckle. It's like uh, if it is a lamp, a very strong lamp that you can control a uh, central wavelength. So why people talk about that? So there is an old story behind that. This proposal appeared for the first time 50 years ago by these uh, Russian authors. One of them is Bazov, the, the guy who, who won the Nobel Prize for laser. The other one is a very famous guy, this one, Letokov, which is very well known from people who work with atomic physics. And uh, uh, they proposed this in this uh, 66. And a little bit later, Letokov said that uh, that would be an explanation to describe laser emissions from uh, astrophysical molecular clouds. Uh, the first unambiguous demonstration of this kind of laser appeared in 1994. There were some uh, papers from the uh, Soviet Union during this period, but the lasers that they, they demonstrate were not efficient. So this one was the first one which was really efficient. And at the same time, this guy from Holland he proposed to call it random laser. This is the original random laser. What they did was to look for rhodamine emission in a colloid containing a titanium dioxide nanoparticles. So what you see here, that's the original picture. At that time, we had, people had to use Polaroid camera. So that's a Polaroid, Polaroid uh, film. And here you have a cell with a rhodamine 
uh, in alcohol. And you see this green beam uh, produces some luminescence in the cell. In this case here, we have the same cell, same concentration of rhodamine, same intensity of the pumping beam, but they put some particles, uh, titanium dioxide particles, with a dimensions of order of uh, several hundred nanometers, below one mic micro. And they could uh, control this, uh, this uh, concentration, and uh, they observed the following. This is the spectrum of rhodamine when they use a very uh, small intensity in here. So that's a broad spectrum, as you, everybody knows. In this case here, that's the spectrum when they are pumping with large in intensity. So the intensity grows very much, and then I reduce by a factor 100 in order to be in the same scale. So there was a narrowing of the line width, and the intensity reduced, uh, increased. And if you measure the intensity as a function of the energy of the pump laser, the energy of the pulses of the pump laser, you see that the, there is a change in the, in the inclination, in the derivative of the curve like that, which indicates that for some intensity, there is a threshold in here. If we do not put this titanium dioxide particles here, the luminescence would not change much. It go like that. So we have here the two main ingredients of a laser. There is a narrowing of the line width, and there is also a, a threshold, a kind of threshold. Two things. The narrowing is not so large as in a conventional laser. Second thing is that this is not so abrupt as in the conventional laser. However, the two ingredients are here. Okay? So that's, uh, at that time, it was called, yeah? Yeah. Could you, you can see the, the behavior if you collect all the, the intensity or if you collect just the uh, wavelengths which correspond to the peak. Okay? And what's going on here? What's going on is that the multiple scatter of light uh, is essential to have this laser operating. So instead of having two mirrors to make a cavity, so you have a scattering in the several particles that are inside the liquid. So you produce uh, a photo or produce light in some position. Before the light goes out of the cell, it passes it for a long way with several scattering by the particles. And along this way, you have amplified spontaneous emission. So the intensity is, is growing. So following this random pathway, we get this laser behavior. That was the explanation at that, that time. So in order to have that, you have to exactly to, to determine the uh, concentration of particles that you have here. Because if the concentration is not very, la very large, large enough, you may have this kind of ballistic propagation of light passing through the me medium. If you have too much particles to, to scatter light, then you have this behavior here, but you may have uh, not much light uh, going in other directions. Okay? So that was the reason because this thing was called a photon pump, a bomb, photon bomb. Because it's like uh, in a nuclear reaction, you have photons going in all directions. So people study and uh, discovered these two kinds of mechanisms that could happen there. One is that the light goes like I mentioned here, and then you have this what's called incoherent feedback. So the amplitude is increasing. But some photons, instead of going like that, they make, make some closed loops. 
they make closing loops, and then they interfere constructively, and then uh, you have this kind of coherent feedback. And the wavelengths, which corresponds to each loop like that, have to be such that uh, n, refractive index, times lambda over 2, should be equal to L, the uh, length of the loop that you consider that. So this kind of laser should have this contribution of amplified spontaneous emission, like that, with the incoherent feedback, plus the coherent feedback. So the observation of coherent feedback was uh, reported also a long time ago for a zinc oxide powder, again, with large uh, grains in the powder. And the spikes which appear in here, that's the spectrum, the spikes in here are due to these uh, closed loops that's formed in the, in the thing. So you have this uh, broad, uh, smooth uh, spectrum here plus these spikes. So the smooth spectrum is due to amplified spontaneous emission, and the spikes are due to this constructive interference. Okay. So uh, that's completely analogous, in this case, to a cavity in the conventional laser. So direction of uh, each mode is uh, arbitrary, is completely different. And uh, more recently, people were able also to control these several modes in order to produce mode locking of this laser. But I'm not going to, to go into these details. So that is, a, that is a picture from this report here. So you have a, a random laser, which uh, uh, can operate with an incoherent feedback or coherent feedback. So it's a laser which does not have a speckle. So it's good for imaging. The conventional one is not good. But there is no directionality. So from, a, from a, a 1994 to 2007, no one proposed a way to, get, to have directionality for this laser without using an optical cavity. There were a few uh, trials. But uh, people did not do that. In 2007, we found a very simple way to get, to have directionality of this laser. We used one of those hollow fiber that was uh, presented here by Philip Russell before. We took this colloid, we closed the hollow tubes around, and then we put this colloid inside there. We had to close it here in order to prevent the colloid in the tubes around the central hole. And by doing this, we have a, a refractive index in the core, which is larger than the refractive in the index of the cladding. The refractive index, index of the cladding, it depends on the glass and the air, which are inside the hollow tubes. So we could have here a refractive index of uh, 1.45, something like that, while in the clad we had 1.3, 1.3, about that. This fiber had this characteristic, the, the central part, the, 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 it, it had a diameter of uh, 10 micrometers, and each tube around 3 micrometers. And then we pump this laser transversely. So we ha could have this random laser, but the light which is emitted is confined along the axis of the hollow fiber. Two feedback mechanisms. One is the total internal reflection because of the difference of refractive index. And the other is the axial feedback that's due to the multiple scattering of light. Okay. So we have here this what was the run, first Randall fiber laser. Uh, and here is a resume of the results. The different colors is for, are for different, uh, for different intensities, pumping intensities. And what you see here is that when I 
when we increase the intensity, there is a narrowing of the line width. These are normalized intensity. So at the same time that there is the narrowing, there is an increase in the amplitude, in the peak amplitude of the emission. Here is the behavior of the line width as a function of the pump intensity, which uh, comes to from 24 nanometers to 6, 5 nanometers. It's not a large reduction like a conventional laser. Uh, and here you can see that there is a threshold as we increase the peak. So at this time, we calculate this figure of merit for this laser, which is given by the threshold intensity, this of dye, and density of scatters, particles that are inside, this, uh, the inverse of this. And this laser was, at that time, at least 100 times better than the conventional random laser. Not the conventional laser, the conventional random laser. Okay? So this uh, paper will appear, I think, in the correct time. Because from there to now, many people have been using this kind of uh, geometry to study this kind of random lasers. And to give you an idea that how this field has been uh, increased, uh, I put here a reference for reports from different groups. Those reports are uh, review papers that indicates that there are several uh, large literature that in such a way that we have in two years, this at least these four review papers. So after that, people discover how to do random laser in a fiber. That was not mentioned before. Uh, there are two proposals, original proposals. In one of them, which was uh, developed at, uh, in Canada in laboratory of uh, Raman Kashiat, who will be here next week. What they did, they took a fiber, doped with erbium, and they put brag grating in the fiber. But instead of put a Bragg grating, a conventional Bragg grating, they put a random Bragg grating. In such a way that the grating is scattered light, but in a uh, random way. So they were able to operate this erbium fiber laser, random erbium fiber laser. So at about the same time, a group in France did the same kind of thing. So that's a, a story of this thing. If you want to, to know about the, what happens from 2007 to today, to, to at least to last year, you may see those uh, reports, these review papers by those people. In particular, these people in here, they are uh, applying these for random lasers, which uh, are made of uh, several kilometers of fiber. So they are very much interested in communication. I cannot tell much about that. I do not work on this field of communication. But it seems that it, it is an important step because they are published in several, in several journals of large uh, impact factor. Okay. OK, so now I'll give some three examples of uh, laser which is not in a fiber just to give you an idea that you can use different materials to, to obtain that. One of that is this uh, random laser made of a piece of plastic, of a polymer. Uh, what we did here was use silver nanoparticles, the ones that I mentioned two days before. And we prepare kind of polyester or PMMA with these particles and rhodamine. And then we develop a new way to prepare that in such a way that the particles are nucleated inside the polymer. And then we could operate these uh, lasers with a threshold well-defined, a reduction of line width. And that's uh, the laser is just a piece of plastic like that. And the color depends on the, the, the dye that we put inside. Another thing is that you can make a, a laser with a flexible material. 
In this case, we, here we have a, a membrane based on cellulose. So some bacteria worked for us to prepare this uh, kind of a piece of paper. That's the microscope, the, the image from my, electron microscope to see the fibers of that. We were able to put dye inside and also particles, nanoparticles in order to increase the intensity. What you see here is that the emission of the dye without nanoparticles, and here you can see that by adding metallic particles here, we could increase also the intensity of the, the laser. And it's possible to, to identify a threshold for the laser to observe a reduction of the, of the line width, as should expect. Uh, some people observe uh, this kind of uh, behavior in different kind of membranes. And there are some group in Italy that they are making this kind of laser in paper. Just to use the paper in order to do some medical, clinical medical uh, exams. Because uh, if you have some uh, uh, molecules above the paper, then it will change the refractive index of the, of the liquid there, and then you may uh, change the intensity of the laser. And then they say, I don't know, I, I do not use this thing, they say that it makes the, the characterization of some thickness, some illness, in a way very simple and very inexpensive. Uh, we try to, to do uh, other things with this kind of laser. So this uh, is a kind of chip that we prepare by using MOCDD. So the chips prepared with a substrate is silic silicon. The scattering material is made of titanium dioxide. And then we put here film with PMMA with uh, rhodamine. Those are the structures that scatter light. So you can see here like uh, micro butterflies or nano butterflies. Okay? And the light is scattered by this. The structure is this, and then we pump transversely. And the film has a refractive index, which is larger than the refractive index of air, and also the refractive index of this region here. So the film acts like a waveguide, a planar waveguide for this laser. So that's a kind of a 2D, two-dimension uh, laser. In this case, the spectrum of the laser, you can see the spikes. The spikes give you, uh, you can be sure that you have a laser in here, because it is due to these uh, several loops, closing loops that you have there. Uh, the experiments, in this case, were done with a rhodamine, pumping in the, with the green with a nanosecond laser. So now we can say that we can observe random lasers in different geometries with different kind of uh, materials, like uh, colloids, powders, membrane, fibers, or shape like that. Uh, so I'm going to show you some examples of things that other people did. For example, this group here in the uh, in US, they use this kind of laser to make diagonals of uh, cancerous tissues. Because in the, in the regions where you have these cancerous uh, cells, the scattering is different from the other part. So they can characterize that. This group here, which is also in the US, Purdue University, uh, they use that to characterize nanoscale structure change in bones. So a small fracture in bones generate uh, holes that if you uh, infiltrate some dyes there, then you have this scattering behavior that I mentioned before. So they could uh, characterize this uh, using this kind of random laser. And the, this group in particular, they have several medical applications for that. But it could 
be present in other systems. For example, the guy who was in the first paper that I mentioned in 1966, Letokot, he died uh, two or three years ago. But uh, he continued to work with these astrophysical lasers. And you can see that's one of the review papers that uh, uh, he wrote. There is a book on astrophysical laser. And more recently, the group from uh, Nice in France, they demonstrate a, a cold atom or random laser, which in some way uh, mimics what's going there in astrophysics, the, a vapor, a disorder, producing emission of random laser. So that's a very broad field with applications in different possible areas. And the, here is a kind of a time timeline of this. So the, the work before 1994, there were the theoretical proposals, some demonstrations of uh, powders doped with neodymium in Soviet Union, but the lasers were not very efficient at that time. In 1994, there was that paper that I mentioned in Nature uh, with uh, particles of 250 nanometers with rhodamine. And then from there, then you have this variation of different kind of, of uh, laser media, like uh, tissues, polymeric solid state, semiconductors, polymers, liquid crystals, uh, silver nanoparticles uh, without any other uh, material around. These random fiber lasers that now it's uh, of uh, large interest, etc. So that's the timetable for this uh, evolution of this random laser. And then I'm going to, to show you some recent examples. First, applications. This group from, uh, from uh, Yale University, they demonstrated that uh, you may have a very good imaging using this in comparison with a conventional laser, just because there is no speckle for this. And what you, you can see here and to compare. So they have these uh, standard uh, films, uh, and they did this experiment like that. They have a light collimated passing through a uh, scattered film. And here, this uh, one of these films, this position. So they, they identify the image which is transmitted through the film. And uh, they did that with different source. You can see here one obtained with a light emitted diode, with a runo laser, with a broadband laser, and with a narrow band laser. And you can see that this image has a much better resolution than the one with narrow bed laser. Same thing in here. This is the helium neon laser, the image uh, collected with a helium neon laser, and here is with the runo laser. So in the two situations, they here they change exactly the order of the film and the scatter. Runo laser is better. So this group is investing uh, in this kind of uh, process, looking for a different kind of images with better resolution now. Again, some review articles. These are not related. Uh, the ones that I mentioned before was related with random lasers, random fiber lasers. This one is, is a general, although there is some one for random fiber laser in here that I mentioned before, this one I mentioned before, and the two new ones. Uh, so there is a large literature now on this field, which seems that it uh, will continue for several years. Then I'm going now to present some new results of our laboratory on this area. And in this case, first I'm, I'm going to present some uh, lasers which emits light with a wavelength that is smaller than the wavelength of excitation. That's called upconversion random laser or Hutch-Stokes random laser. And again, to contradict what Lazar said, in this case, 
I'm very much interested in a material which absorbs very much by two, two and three photons. Okay, he said that. Were you here? Yeah, he said, well, if you have a good absorber, send to me because uh, you don't want good absorbers. Here, I'm showing that uh, we want good absorbers. Uh, so the first example is this. is a three-photon ex excitation of a uh, stokes laser using a special organic uh, dye. So what we have here is a turnable OPO operating uh, uh, 150 photosecond. We pump the liquid which is inside this cell, collect the light, and analyze with CCD. In this case, the singlet that's pumped is this one here, which uh, is uh, we reach that, that level by absorption of three photons. No resonant absorption of three photons. I mean, there is no real level in here. So three fold absorption goes to that singlet state there. So there is a relaxation to this one here, and then emission of 560. You see here the absorbance of this liquid. Uh, we pump in this position here, and we look for laser emission at this position in, in a way, in a wavelength such that the absorbance is uh, negligible. So by doing this, we pump a laser with 1.3 and obtain laser in the 560. And again, in this case, when you study details of the spectrum, so you can identify that in this case, we have both effects. The effect of uh, incoherent feedback and coherent feedback. This uh, uh, coherent feedback originates these spikes that you can observe here. If you do the measurement with a single shot, you can observe this. If you do, if you integrate several shots, you see a profile smooth like that. But uh, what you see here is that uh, both feedback are present. In this case, you see that the line width goes from there to here at about uh, 18, 18 uh, microjoules, pulse. Uh, pulse energy, and here the threshold uh, for the intensity. So this is a laser, random, operated photosecond. Uh, photosecond, uh, pumping with photosecond. And the time duration is of the order of hundreds of photoseconds. Uh, in this case here, we did the same kind of experiment with the powders of zinc oxide. At the beginning of the talk, I have sh shown uh, results from the group from Yale, where they observed this random laser by zinc oxide powders. And that, in that paper, they report the first random laser with coherent feedback. So what we did here, we used grains of zinc oxide with uh, dimensions of, uh, I don't remember exactly, hundreds of nanoseconds. Uh, and uh, we repeat the experiment of this group there. But uh, instead of use a powder and shine light in the powder, we made some uh, kind of uh, guide where we put the powder in order to have the emission uh, directional. We also pump with uh, two photons. Zinc oxide is a semiconductor with very large band gap. Band gap is in the blue. So. To do the experiment with a one photo excitation, we use 354 nanometer. We observe this random laser with two photon excitations, so we change wavelength in order to have transition by two photons, and also with three photon excitation. So that is powder, but the, the beam was almost guide. But if we make a film, with zinc oxide, you can also observe this emission. And in this case, you have the beam guided uh, along the film. I mean, the random laser emitted guided along the film. So those were effects of chi-3 and chi-5. Three photo absorption is related to chi-5. And two photo absorption is related to chi-3. 
Okay, now I want to show you some second order parametric effects in this laser. So again, the same equation that sometimes we cannot deal correctly. Uh, but uh, I'm going back to this contribution here. So the previous was chi 3 and chi 5. Now I'm talking about chi 2. And just to, rem to re remind you, those are the figures that we show two days ago. If we have a, a beam with two frequencies, then you may have a second amount generation, cell frequency, uh, some frequency generation, and different frequency generation. Okay. So we are going to work with a material which does not have inversion symmetry. Those are nanocrystals that does not have a center of symmetry. Those are nanocrystals of uh, aluminum borate doped with neodymium and terbium. We did some spectroscopy of that, and then we got this uh, multi-wavelength emission that I'm going to, to describe now. So the gap of the nanocrystal is large, so we put neodymium inside. And then we have the levels, energy levels of neodymium inside the gap. And the levels which are of interest here are the ground state here and this excited state here. So we pump with 806 which is a very large absorption cross-section, and observe this uh, neodymium laser in this transition, which is the, the usual transition, 1.06 microns. The laser medium is a powder, and that's the distribution of size. So the maximum of the distribution is around 170, 180 nanometers of dimension. But there are some other which are larger here. You see here the spectrum, which is, corresponds to the transition from there to here, at low power excitation, the blue one. That was obtained with 0 0.76 millijoules. The intensity was small. It was multiplied by 12, by 18, in order to put in this scale, in the same frame. Pumping with 0 0.9, you see this uh, yellow, orange line here. And if we, if we pump with 1.02 millijoules, then we have this uh, uh, line very narrow. So this line here is larger than the emission at low power intensity by a factor which is uh, 1 times 18. Uh, it's about 15 times larger. Uh, the experiment was done by pumping with a nanosecond laser, in this case. And this is the line width behavior and the intensity behavior. In this case, you see that the line width goes very fast, abruptly, around the spectrum, around the uh, threshold. Okay? It goes from uh, 1.2 uh, something to 0.2 uh, something. So it's a very abrupt change. And here is the behavior of the intensity as a function of the excitation pulse. Here you can see the threshold, the laser threshold, very well uh, defined here. This corresponds to the position which is almost in this uh, abrupt change here. So what I'm going to show now is that besides the stimulated emission, Besides the light scatter, multiple light scatter, which originates this laser, we could observe other nonlinear effects in here. And the linear effects that I'm going to show here is that it's possible this laser to generate second harmonic. That's called self frequency, self second harmonic generation. And it's also possible to generate some frequency. Uh, so, Ah, is it here? Yeah. We pump with uh, 806, 806 nanometers. So the neodymium generates a laser at 1.1062 nanometers. 
but that is enough intensity in order to generate the second ammonica. So from the powder, we see the second ammonica. Yeah. But since the laser is present and this, it's very strong, it may combine with 1062 and generate 4, 5, 9 nanometers. And also the second ammonica of the pump laser is present. So that's a kind of multi-wave length uh, laser, where you can see the, the three effects. And the relative intensity are shown here. So that's the self-sum frequency, and that's the second harmonic. And this is the excitation laser second harmonic that corresponds to this one here. And the behavior of the intensity with the energy of the excitation pulse uh, corresponds to what we expect in terms of the number of electric fields, optical fields, which are presented. We did a little more with this uh, material in order to optimize the behavior. So that one was made with a concentration of neodymium, which was about, uh, it was 4%, is this one here? In this case here, we studied several different concentrations in order to uh, study how the two effects occur here, the effect of random laser and the parametric effects, in order to identify which is the better concentration to have one effect or another. And what you see here is that the behavior of this, the intensity of the random laser as a function of neodymium concentration, and here the behavior of the uh, self frequency generation corresponds to the second harmonic, some, some frequency uh, generation there. So, by doing this, we continue with the experiment. Of course, we did not show this, send this originally to scientific reports, but that was the referee option. So the paper was uh, in scientific reports. So I remember the oh, yeah. comments in the lunch time. So since we could have this second ammonia generation, then we try to, to observe a, a possibility to have a source which has a tunable wavelength. And the experiment was done uh, with different uh, frequencies, instant frequencies. Uh, just to exploiting the resonance of neodymium. And, uh, well, this is the re diffuse reflectance spectrum of neodymium, which allows you to see where are those levels there. And then we pump almost in resonance with that, those. And then we could observe uh, random laser emission. And we could also observe the second ammonic. So, in this uh, figure here, we summarize the emission, total emission, due to the second harmonic of the excitation beam and the, due to the several parametric process which is ha uh, occurring there. So that's the spectrum which is covered by this source. So this is a source which has a, a, a spectrum continuum, although the intensity are different in different regions, but we cover this, the whole spectrum here. So this is the uh, first demonstration of a tunable random laser. Now I'm going to talk something that is very fast. I don't know, perhaps I have uh, 10 minutes more, eight, eight minutes, or it's OK, it's finished. OK, so I go very fast. Uh, ultra fast. Ultra fast. <laughs> yeah. Several years ago, this group from Italy, they proposed what they call glassy behavior of light. What's the, what's the meaning of that? They, they found that uh, this kind of uh, random laser can be uh, is uh, analogous of a magnetic system. A uh, spin glass of a, magne uh, sp a magnetic spin glass. A spin glass, I don't know 
if you studied this, is a, uh, a material is a spin glass when the spins are frozen in arbitrary direction. Okay, the parametric, the paramagnet, paramagnetic material, you have spins oriented random, randomly. Ferromagnetic, you have all spins oriented in one direction. Spin glass have a group of spins like that, another group like that, another like that, frozen in this position. So they made an analogy of the spins with the modes of this random laser. And so they, they proposed, that's a theory, they published uh, several papers by doing a very detailed work on this glassy behavior of light. And uh, that was, the initial paper was uh, in 2006, and the same group, they give the first experimental evidence of uh, what's called replica symmetry breaking in random laser. The idea is that, suppose that you keep the, the uh, spins, and then you measure something related to the order of these spins, different times without changing the, the spin system. And then, uh, because of fluctuation, quantum fluctuations, they show that uh, this system of spin does not uh, present the same structure as before. So the structure changes, and there are some probability to observe different structures. I will not have time to go into more details. But by doing this kind of analogy, this group could show that this theory of replica symmetry breaking uh, is satisfied. And that was the first time in any physical system that was proven. It means that even in magnetism, people could not uh, prove this theory. And by this analogy, they said that well, now I'm showing that we have a, a very uh, efficient material system in order to prove this theory. And then we, that's just an advertise. We did experiments last year uh, where we observed for the first time this uh, replica symmetry breaking by doing a single shot and observe this kind of uh, statistical photos which is emitted. And we also observe the same kind of behavior uh, in a dye with a rhodamine and titanium dioxide, like the first paper published in 1994. This paper uh, will appear August 1st. It was published two days before. I got this copy two days before. It was published uh, ele uh, electronic version is there. So if you become interested in something more sophisticated that has something like a, a connection with complex system in physics in general, so we are going, we are doing this kind of example. So just to finish, I want to emphasize that. Uh, this disordered medium in general is a very interesting system to, to work. It is a kind of platform to study different kind of effects in different areas, like uh, laser physics, nonlinear optics. I have shown an example of laser physics and nonlinear optics. I'm telling you something that I'm not proving, but are on those papers, you can do statistical physics. You can do other things with that. So it's a very broad area that appeared that it was, it, uh, was grown in the past uh, uh, 20, 20 something years. Okay, so I finish here. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm open for questions. Don't ask about uh, those equations now. <laughs> huh? Thank you so much, Sidney, for all your courses. We have time for a quick question and then Sidney, of course, will be around and to, tomorrow also, huh? No, tomorrow will be in Rio. I go to Rio, yeah. Okay, so one question. So, uh, 
you talked about two uh, feedback mechanism resonant feedback and non resonant feedback in random gazing systems mm -hmm. uh, experimentally what are the signatures for uh, resonant feedback for resonant feedback yeah, yeah. You, you remember the, the loops that's what's called resonant feedbacks because they in order to close the loop you have to have a matching between the wavelength and the the size of the loop but well, what experimental signature do you see because you cannot see the loop in the system from outside no the loop exists because you have co uh, uh, interference constructive interference there so the light is still there so that's a kind of coherent i think that she that she opened. yeah she has already okay that's it uh the random random fiber laser you use uh, pcf fiber but yeah can you use a single mode fiber with the car change to the scattery? Yeah, measure? that was uh, what uh, Ramon Kashyap did with a fiber doped with erbium. He'll be here next week, so you can uh, repeat this question for him. Okay, but, but it was a sing uh, it was a single mode fiber uh, with a bright grating, a random bright grating. Ah. One more there. Ina. Professor, I wanted to ask, maybe it's a very naive question, but how do those samples be prepared with nanoparticles? Are those nanoparticles readily available from market and just mix, or there is a process to make them? I did not understand the, the rest are, of the question. How are the samples being prepared? Ah, it's chemical synthesis. I, I do not prepare these materials. Uh, but uh, it's not complicated according to my colleague that prepares those, OK? Uh, this kind of uh, material, this uh, sodium, yttrium sodium borate, are very old material as a bulk crystal. And uh, people use that to make lasers uh, for about 10 years ago. But no one used this material to do a random laser. And then that was our guide. We took a material which we know that's efficient for laser, and then we asked this guy to prepare these nanocrystals, and then it happens. Okay. Thank you. More questions? This one there. So, uh, what determines the line width of the around the laser? Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a very difficult uh, question, huh? Because you know uh, you have different uh, uh, we have nanocrystals, and when I say that I have a 0 0.04 of neodymium, for example, uh, that's a, an average. You may have uh, nanocrystals with a different uh, uh, concentration individually, and then uh, this if you have uh, inside the nanocrystals. Uh, several neodymium ions, they interact, so they, they have a, a different line width. Again, the neodymium does not enter always in the same position in the crystalline structure. So it does not enter in the same crystalline position, so it changes the frequency a little bit. So these two effects combine and make the line width to be, to be large. Because I was wondering, uh, uh, you have amplification and you have a partial oscillation. Um, I don't know what's the oscillation? rate. Oscillation? Yeah. Kind of a partial oscillation. Because do you have some uh, partial feedback? Ah, okay. and, mm -hmm. and if you increase the mean, uh, mean path, ground trip path, you can yeah. increase the line. That's a, make much sense, this question. I did not emphasize here that uh, it's very important the control of the hot spot of the beam. The, the result depends very much of how much you pump in the powder. Okay? And uh, you see, you have to have a, uh, there is an optimal, opti oh, you are here, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're just up there. Okay. There is an optimum uh, size that we discover experimentally. We change the position of the lens in order to minimize the threshold, in order to have this uh, very good behavior of line width. Okay. This is very important. I forgot to, I cannot say everything. Okay, let's thank again Professor Sidi. Okay.
Thank you. Sorry, I myself has like a five other questions. Yeah. <laughs>